Uh, Tina is our sergeant at arms, and then she'll be introducing our speaker as well. So smattering of applause for <laughs> Tina. Hi, everybody. Well, Dan, I got to start with you. You got a girl that loves calculus, and she's going to the School of Mines, and you don't say a word. I, I want her to come here instead. Well, sorry. When I heard calculus and nothing else, that, that'll be a buck out of you. <laughs> uh, so I, I think we're going to keep this real simple today. How many people in the audience put mayonnaise on their salad today, or on their sandwich? Excellent, 50 cents. How many people put mustard? 50 cents. How many people put mayo, mustard, and horseradish? Wow, you learn fast, don't you? <laughs> and that was going to be a bigger fine. The last question I have for you is how many have bought your raffle tickets? Oh, good. Anyone who has not bought their raffle tickets, which includes me, that'll be a dollar. So for next week, I'm going to ask Ranjit if he can be the sergeant at arms. All right. And our speaker today is Patrick, and he looks like he's ready to go. So originally, we were going to have two students from Pakistan here today. They're part of an uh, exchange program that's sponsored by the US government. Um, but one of them lost her passport. Um, and you only can review it or renew it in person at the nearest consulate, which is Chicago. So since she has a one-way ticket home starting in the first week of May, she had to go get that taken care of. So um, you have me today. Um, so this is was put together in my office um, before here, so I, um, before the meeting, so I appreciate any, if there's any typos, Darwin, let me know and I can quick fix it, you know, to make sure we're the record straight. So today I'm gonna talk about um, the University of South Dakota's exchange programs, um, and also um, the sort of the type of students we're getting in on those exchange programs. Um, I work in the international office on campus, and one of my roles is coordinating our exchange agreements. Um, so I collaborate with um, the CAGE, the Center for Academic and Global Engagement. They handle the students that go outbound. I handle the students that come inbound. Um, so that will be the focus of my presentation today, will be the inbound students. Um, so we'll have a couple exchange programs that are, um, are, um, that are only for USD students going outbound. But if you want to talk about those at the end, I'm happy to do that, though I'm not, you know, um, super well versed in those. So. <clears throat> To start out, um, there's two types of exchange programs. Um, these students come in on what's called the J-1 visa, which is a um, multiple categories in the J-1 visa, but it's um, basically the goal of that particular visa type is to foster um, educational um, exchange between countries, but also um, there are uh, student interns, so if a student um, you know, from France wants to come, you know, do research in a facility in the U.S., they could come in through that category. Um, there's an au pair category, so if you, people want to come and take care of U.S. children as part of an au pair program for a year or two, they can do that. Um, so there's, I think, probably 30 to 50 categories um, that include not just students, but also faculty and researchers and things like that. So um, there's a few requirements for J visas. It does have to have a cultural component, um, and it does have to um, be focused on exchange. Um, and the, it can't, the funding mechanism has to be basically a foreign government, the U.S. government, or um, uh, a nonprofit entity. Um, or something that's not personal funds for that. So that is a, um, so that's on the sponsored end. So this is all the J-1 visa. So we have two sections here of exchange programs, the bilateral. So this is your typical, we work with University X. Um, we like them, they like us, and we put together an agreement, and then we agree to collaborate, um, send students, send faculty. Um, uh, if we want to, you know, any other sort of formal collaboration, we have um, an agreement that does need to be approved by the South Dakota Board of Regents. So this isn't something that, you know, you meet somebody on a plane and boom, you have an exchange agreement, but it does, it is a process. Um, it is thankfully fairly simple right now, but it can take, you know, the whole process can take six months to a year to work through. Um, 
but so they're reciprocating um, and they are governed by parity. What that means is, so when our bilateral exchange students come, they do not pay USD tuition and fees. They pay at their home university. Our students that go out pay at the home university. But um, so because of that, um, we need to kind of keep the number of students outgoing and ingoing about the same. And that's also sort of a component with the J-1 visa as well. So, um, <clears throat> so we can't really get 100 students in on an exchange agreement if we send out five. It needs to be sort of close. Um, and so that's something part of my role in the cage. We monitor that pretty closely. Um, and then the second is the sponsored. Um, that's what the two Pakistani students would have discussed with you today is their specific program. Um, so it's most of the ones we have are funded by the US government, but some foreign governments will send um, their students here for a semester or a year. Um, and then also a nonprofit entity. We do have a student from Japan who's here getting a degree on a J-1 visa and he's um, um, a clinical psychologist in Japan and worked a lot with the earthquake and the tsunami aftermath. So he's here in our disaster mental health um, program to gain knowledge and to go back um, and work um, in Japan on those sorts of issues. So um, kind of a unique thing. Um, and also kind of fitting into this, if we think kind of Rotary Youth Exchange, which I'm the incoming district chair for uh, Rotary Youth Exchange, it kind of is a similar thing, right? So if we host in our district, host two students, we, and we have to send two students and those sorts of things. So, um, and they're also coming, the students that come in to us, so like Talia that was here two years ago, she would have been on a J-1 visa, so a lot of the similar requirements, so. So what I mean by exchange students, I think sometimes the terms like international student exchange students are used together, but um, for us, it's we're focusing on incoming students. It's short-term study. Um, they're here for a semester or an academic year. Um, they're non-degree, so they're not getting a degree from USD. Um, about 98% of them won't get a degree. They'll get a degree from their home institution. Their credits will transfer back. Um, and so it's a fairly small number. About Of our 250 international students, about 19 are what we would classify as exchange students, so non-degree, um, short-term students. So you can see the vast majority of our students are here for two years for a master's, four years for a bachelor's, or five to seven for a PhD. Um, so um, that just gives you a little bit of context. So this is a smaller part of my job, but um, it is a um, key part nonetheless. So when I talk about students um, or exchange students, that's kind of what I'm referring to is the these students that meet this category. So this is my first attempt ever at a Google map of putting where our exchange partners are, but you can see on there um, we have eight now. Uh, yes, nine, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. Yeah, so um, most of them you could see are kind of Germany um, in Europe, um, but then we do have one in Japan and one in Australia. Um, part of the reason these are our bilateral exchanges, so I'm, there are universities all over the world that would love to collaborate with U.S. universities. The problem is, is if we're thinking of parity, um, and you, we have to make sure that when we have an agreement, one of the key factors is, are USD students or American students interested in going to that country? Um, and to be frank, it, it, you know, that's something we have to think about. Um, and also, are students going there if the classes either have to be taught in English, because or the students have to know that language? So we have four languages offered on campus, French, German, Spanish, and Russian. Um, and arguably you have to be probably, you know, two years of Russian and going to a Russian university, if the classes are in Russian, it's probably gonna be difficult. So, you, so that kind of limits us a little bit, but thankfully English is becoming, more and more universities are have, moving towards all English classes, because one, they want to attract international students to their program. So like in, let's say China, there's an increasing number of universities taught or have programs early in English, because they don't want just American or British or Australian students, they want students from India or Bangladesh or whatever, that they're not really gonna speak Mandarin, but they're probably going to know English. So it, as we go forward, I think it will expand the number, our opportunities um, for those students as well. So I'm just gonna briefly kind of go through our eight partners here, um, just give you a little bit of background. So the first is the University of Western Australia. This is in Perth. So if you think basically as far west and south as you can go in Australia, um, founded in 1911, it is one of the best universities in Australia and it's ranked in the top 125 of the world in world rankings, so it is an excellent university. The students that come to us from Western Australia are almost all business students. Um, we, um, it, we, it's uh, probably one of our more robust exchanges in that we had three students in the fall. Um, we didn't have any students this semester, but in previous years we have 
two to five students a year from Western Australia. Um, they, again, take courses in business. Um, some in sports management, is seen, we're seeing a couple students in that regard. And it's a popular destination for USD students. Um, Australia is not a tough sell um, to get students to go there. So it is a pretty robust exchange. And I think as we go um, forward, I think that is an area of growth that I think we'll see increasing numbers of students from Western Australia and increasing the number of students we send to them. Um, our second exchange, this is also focused solely on business, partly because it's um, a business university. So it's Otaro University of Commerce in Japan. It's in Hokkaido, which is the North Island. So the students that come from Hokkaido, it gets a lot of snow and ice and cold, so they adjust pretty well here. Um, it's a relatively new university. Um, it has about 2,500 students. So it is our smallest exchange partner. Um, and they only offer about five or six degrees, and they pretty much all focus on business and like law, business law, and then they also have some IT tech. So, and our, so our students from Otaru come into um, only into our College of Business because that's what they take back home. Um, so, University of South Wales. Um, it used to be we prior to 2013 we had an agreement with the University of Glamorgan, um, which is also in Wales. Um, so you could see on this map up top here. They have four campuses. That's because there were two universities and they merged together. Um, so while it was only founded in 2013, it dates back to the 1840s. Um, so our students, most of them will go to this Triforest campus on the left. I believe that's where Glamorgan was. Um, but uh, so our agreement specifically with Triforest, but um, they can, um, I think through some moving things around, moving pieces of paper, they can pretty much go to anywhere there. Um, this one is more focused on like the Faculty of Arts um, and like, um, yeah, so this, this agreement, it's not necessarily through the whole university, but specific. The students that come to us are coming from specific um, faculties there as opposed from the whole university. So we see a lot of uh, um, education, psychology, those sorts of things as well, it seems, from that agreement. Um, this one is not, we haven't, we've had one student the past three years. We've and sent about the same out, so it's not a terribly popular exchange for whatever reason. I think just maybe if people are thinking of the UK, they don't think of South Wales, um, Southern Wales, I should say. So um, we'll see a lot more students going to um, our one-way partner in Edge Hill, which is in, I think, Central. We have a, I don't know, Edge Hill, somewhere in, I think, North Central um, England, but I'm not 100%. Um, our next exchange, um, Pashmani Peter Catholic University. Um, this has been going for close to a decade now. Um, it is our only private university that we partner with. Um, it's in Piliscaba. Your guess is as good as mine, if that's the correct pronunciation, but it's in Hungary. It's just outside of Budapest. It's about 30 minutes out there. They do have um, campuses in Budapest. It is um, one of the leading universities in Hungary. It's one of the leading Catholic universities in Europe. They have close partnerships with um, like St. Louis University and Notre Dame. Um, it has a lot of canon law and church, you know, church law, those sorts of programs. Our students aren't necessarily going into that. Um, our main, we, they're basically going into the Faculty of Humanities is where we're seeing our students go. Um, you know, we haven't had a student from Hungary in five or six years, but it's been pretty popular for our students going there. Um, I had a lot of friends when I did my bachelor's here back in the, I don't know, what the aughts, 2006 to seven, eight in there. Um, and we are sending a student there this year. Um, it had sort of died out, but um, they had a change of staff and we were able to get that um, renewed with um, this last year, which was good. It is a, you know, it's a pretty established university. Hungary's a very affordable place for students to go, our students, because Hungary's, you know, by European standards, pretty affordable. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a respectable university. It's one of the best universities that we have a partnership with. So we're sort of punching above our weight a little bit there. So hopefully we'll see more students heading there. Um, and they have a fair number of classes that are taught in English because they're really, um, have a, a, the Erasmus program in Europe that a lot of students can go study abroad for a semester or a year within Europe. Um, and so they're a key part player in that. So they do have a lot of coursework in English as well. So that helps our students because not, the odds of our students knowing Hungarians probably pretty small, I would guess. <clears throat> so University of Vigo, um, this is in the northwest of Spain. Um, this is the you know the rainiest part. This is also you know the Gaelic part. You know it's very similar with Brittany and um, Ireland and Scotland and that sort of thing. Um, we've had students that come from Vigo. They come with one or two and they come for a whole academic year. And we've actually had two that have now had they, they left and they came and um, pursued a master's degree at USD. Um, so that it is a pretty, um, 
you know, they seem to like it here, which is good. Um, and uh, one of my our graduate assistants in our office who graduated in December, she did her bachelor's at Vigo and came to study abroad at USD, returned, um, and she just finished her master's in communication. Um, so this is a fairly new university, but um, it was a branch of the University of Santiago de Compostela. And so, um, but in the 90s, they broke away. And you could see up, it's kind of up. It's a very modernist campus. Um, so I think the one thing here is the student life maybe isn't quite as developed at Vigo, but um, the town, a lot of the students just live in town and take the bus up. So it is kind of more of a, a city feel um, there in Vigo. So. So this is our newest exchange. Um, it's the University of, I call it Honigen, but some people call it Groningen. I don't know. We've, I've heard Dutch people say it four different ways, so that's not very helpful. But um, this is one that came out of, uh, I went to the Netherlands on a recruitment trip um, in December of 16, um, or 17, I can't remember. But, um, and so that was something where in, we worked with the Fulbright office in the Netherlands, and so they we're, we're trying to find ways to build um, USD's image in the Netherlands um, to get students that would want to come study um, for degrees. And they suggested looking at partnerships with a handful of universities, mainly their American Studies program. So the University of Honigan, um, they have a, one of the leading American Studies programs in Europe. Um, and so we um, reached out to them uh, after going there. Um, actually, one of our students, he came from Master's in Computer Science. He graduated from University of Honigan's um, American Studies program, so he also was able to vouch for us and kind of connect us with them. Um, so this is currently going through the BOR, BOR process. Um, so it's been about six months in the making, but it's a lot of you know paper going back and forth across the Atlantic, so it does take time. But um, additionally, it was just going to mainly be a focus between um, uh, our history, Native American Studies, um, and anthropology programs, because that's really of an interest um, for the American Studies, that's the students we would receive, right? So they were really impressed by um, the collections we have on campus, Oral History Center and those sorts of things, um, largely because the American Studies students at this university have to do a thesis, um, a research thesis. And so they, usually they come in their senior year, that first semester, they come to the US, do research, collect you know um, information, data, whatever, and then return home and write their thesis. So, um, for, the, so for them to be able to come and do um, look into Native history, Western history, Western American history, that sort of thing was um, uh, a big draw for them. So uh, we've moved forward with this, and now the, um, where they're adding two more faculties. So we have the American Studies faculty, they're adding in uh, Business and Economics, and then their College of Arts, um, or College of Liberal Arts, which is kind of a catch-all. So, um, so we'll, our students will have more um, opportunities when they go over. A lot of the courses are taught in English. Of course, American Studies is all taught in English, so it would be fairly simple for our students going there. It is one of the best universities in the world. It's top 100, founded in 1614. It's one of the best in the Netherlands. Um, so it is, um, I mean, if we just, rankings aren't everything as we know, but if we're going by that, it's pro we, it's probably fairly lucky that we got this, so that's good. But um, and, uh, Kurt Hackamer from History actually was over there. He visited the campus and did a site visit um, over spring break. Um, so of course, his department, he oversees History and Native Studies. Um, so they'll be um, uh, uh, working really closely with um, our counterparts there in Honigan. So. So, and then lastly, we have three partners in Germany. We're trying to add a fourth. The fourth partner um, we're still working on. Um, we'll see, but I think we're, we are moving forward with that, and it's at a teacher's college, Pedagogische Hochschule, and so specifically, they have specific schools that only teach teachers, train teachers. So, like, we have the School of Ed at the university. In Germany, they have a separate system, largely, um, at least in the state of Germany that the school's at. So. Um, we're hoping it would be a good outlet for our education students that do have very specific requirements of what courses they have to take to be certified in the US. If they can go to a teacher's college, the idea being hopefully they'll be able to um, knock those out a bit easier. So our next, um, so the, we have three partners in Germany, Karl von Ositzky, University of Oldenburg. So this is in Northwest Germany. Um, so it is a fairly new university. It started as a teacher's college, but is now a full-fledged university. They're a world leader in sustainability research, which is kind of what I'm hoping that with our sustainability program, we'll be able to get students to go there to study and vice versa. And we do have um, a student going there this year, so I hope um, we can get that going. And they're also, um, as they started as a teacher's college, have very strong education partnerships. And they do have good synergy in the sense that they're about two, three hours driving from Honigan. And so they do have partnerships there, so it's kind of neat that we're partners with both of those universities. 
And then we're at Friedrich Schiller University in Jena. This is in formerly East Germany, um, so sort of East Central Germany. Uh, it's in Jena, uh, founded in 1558. They, it's a very good university, a lot of science faculty, but then they're I'm not an expert in German idealism and early romanticism, but there's a lot of uh, um, leading intellectuals like Hegel and others that study there or affiliated with the university. Um, and Zeiss, you know, the lens maker, was founded in Jena, so there's a lot of, there's actually a big tower that's really ugly, but right in the middle of the town, it's um, a Zeiss um, headquarters. So they do a lot of work with lasers and those sorts of things and optics um, at the University of Jena. So um, the downside with Jena is a lot of their courses are still taught in German. So it's, it's more difficult for a student who doesn't know German to be able to go study abroad there. Um, but we're hoping, you know, we'll get some German speakers over there. Lastly, we have Ostfalia University of Applied Sciences in Wolfsburg. We have other campuses, but we partner with the Wolfsburg campus. Um, and this is a Hochschule, which is like a, a technical school, but it's not like, you know, in the US, the technical schools. This is, they're fairly equivalent to like a four-year bachelor's in, in Germany. So. Um, our students that come from Ostfalia, again, go to the College of Business. Um, so we'll have three incoming from Ostfalia this, this uh, fall. Um, and this is also um, David Carr from Business. Um, we'll go over there from time to time and teach and take students. Um, and uh, <clears throat> Wolfsburg is the headquarters of Volkswagen. So our students that go over there do have opportunities to extern at Volkswagen corporate headquarters and things like that, which is a pretty unique um, experience and so um, especially with Volkswagen moving more production facilities and that sort of thing to the US I think it's hopefully something that our students would you know kind of an easy way to get an internship at a one of the you know fortune 500 company so so that's a little bit about our bilateral exchanges I'm going to talk briefly about the sponsored exchanges um, so these are um, so on these students are paying fees right so they're paying fees at home um, they're paying their expenses to get over here, those sorts of things. So these are, you know, you have to have some financial ability to be able to come over. Um, so the German students kind of have it lucky because, you know, tuition in Germany is zero dollars. So they just basically pay their living expenses. So um, Australia, others, they're about comparable to what our fees would be at USD. But so these students are there, mostly it's a, f a free ride. If we, But there's a lot more requirements on them. These students, the bilateral exchange basically come take classes, can goof around, do whatever they want. These students have very strict um, requirements because it is a government-sponsored exchange. So we have the year program. It's the year of education abroad for Russians. Um, so this was our first um, government-sponsored exchange that we were able to get on. Um, it came out of um, some work that I did at the embassy in Moscow. And so that was a, they re brought the program back. So we were able to get on the ground floor. Last year we had four students, this year we have five. They're from all over Russia. They're usually going to be students that have, they would not be able to come to the US but for help from the US government. Um, and so they do study for a year. Um, they live with host families for the month of July before they move into the dorms. Um, they have uh, training in DC before they come to help them um, adjust to American education. Once they're here, there's, um, they have, to have to volunteer in the community for like 30 hours a semester, um, things like that. Uh, it's a very good program. They've, I know uh, Il Il Tim Shoren's wife, Elmira, has been really grateful that she has some Russian native speakers that she can uh, uh, force her students to uh, tutor with in her Russian classes, so that's been good. They've been very active on campus, um, like at the welcome table every year. We seem to get students that they go, go every week to the welcome table. Um, and volunteer. Um, last year we had um, an amazing pianist, um, and so the, some of the faculty there said he was probably one of the best undergraduate students that they've ever had in the piano program, and we're sad that he only could be here for a year. Um, and uh, so yeah, like I said, we currently have five students on campus. We're hoping to get four or five next year. Um, USD, I think because we are affordable tuition-wise, um, we're able to get more of these students than a more expensive school that's, you know, they could basically send three students here for the price they'd send to one to maybe Wisconsin-Madison or something like that. So um, the second one, Global UGrad Pakistan, this came out of, I traveled to Pakistan for the first time last September, um, and so for a recruitment event. And so this is part, this is also paid for by the US government. Um, the, it's um, administered by the Fulbright Center in Pakistan, um, obviously for good, good reasons, right? The, the, the reason why we have you know, Russia, Pakistan, these other things is it's a diplomacy tool um, that the US government views that if we can 
invest in these individuals when they go back. It's going to help the U.S. in the long run because the idea being if you come here, you're going to probably have a good experience and it's less likely to be have negative views of um, the U.S., right? So that's kind of why Russia is uh, it's actually a growing program and Pakistan as well. So that's why we pay for that. Um, but uh, so they're here for the first semester. Those are the two students that would have been presenting today. The, um, both of them are female. This is the, they're the first um, people, first women in their families ever to go to university. So they are in universities in Pakistan. Um, both of these programs up here, well, actually all three have to like intense um, academic requirements. So um, you have to, of course, fluency in English. Your test scores have to be in, like the top five to ten percent in your university. So these are very very good students. Um, so the, both Pakistani students, again, business is a common thread. They are um, taking classes in the business school, one's economics, one's human resource management, specialization. So this is the first semester that we have them. We applied to host more of them in subsequent semesters, so we're hoping that we're able to get more students um, starting in the fall. So, And lastly, this is um, the Campus Scholarship Program. This is our first year hosting those students. Um, this one's unique in that it's a sponsored exchange, but the students still pay most of the cost themselves. Um, but uh, they would um, have to be in the top 20% or so in their um, leaving exams in the Netherlands to qualify. They come to, this program's been going for about 50, 60 years. It's a post-World War II effort um, to help rebuild the Netherlands. It's been going on strong. There's a good alumni network in the country as well. So these students, it's a gap year program. So they just leave high school, come here for a year, and then they'll return and finish their degrees in the Netherlands. Um, unlike the, these two programs, the Russian and the Pakistani program, they have to leave and not come back for two years. They have to go home. They can't just say, I like it here, I'm going to stay. They do have to go home as part of their visa. These students here, the campus scholarship program, if they like it here for a year, they can stay, largely because they're not really getting um, a lot of government funding. So, um, and so those students, the all, so the year program and campus scholarship, they come for one year, Pakistani U grads for a semester. Um, and we're also applying for a program from Tunisia where students would come. We'd hopefully get one or two students from Tunisia to come for next year. Um, and they would, that would be similar to the year program. So that is what I have. Um, I noticed we're doing pretty good on time. So if anyone has any questions about that or about how we send USD students abroad or what goes in exchange agreements or anything, I'm happy to answer those. Yeah. So usually it's pretty darn good. Um, so we do have minimum requirements. Um, that's the TOEFL test of English as a foreign language and the IELTS exam that students have to take. Our exchange students don't have to take those because in our agreements, um, our no the nominating university has to whatever process that they have. Um, so our, our, obviously our Australian students don't have a problem for obvious reasons. The Germans don't have a problem. I mean, the Japanese students, it's, you know, they're good, it's, but it could, could be better, but I think that's it's typically not a problem. Um, language tends to not be a problem. So, it's more of a comment versus a question. Uh, I did my study program in college in Belgium. Mm. The mental health school was very I've got to say that even when my kids, the two young kids, they get to be university material, they went to college abroad. I'm going to force them to go abroad just by spending that semester Yeah, and I think we see that with the students that go abroad from USD, by and large, they love it and they come back and they want to go again. So we sort of have the, you know, the repeat offenders as we call them, right? That they, there are some students that come, they might go in their freshman, sophomore year and they spend more time outside the country than in, it seems like. Um, but I mean, cost is a factor, of course, right? I mean, but thankfully with our direct exchange, all these direct, eight direct partners, students can use their USD scholarships and financial aid um, to go abroad. So it is, um, you know, the difficult part is, you know, if they go over the semester, well, I'm involved in these activities, I have to give that up to go abroad for a semester, or over the summer I always work and so I can't, you know, so that's something that we see. So it is, we do have a lot more interest in students wanting to come to USD right now, but um, I think some of the best ambassadors for students to go abroad, to get RU students to go abroad, are those students coming in, um, you know, from because the, they mix really well on campus and they get to know people, and so they're good ambassadors for their countries and their 
um, you know, their schools as well. So. Nope. Pat, do you pair up the students with uh, a faculty advisor and, uh, with another student perhaps? perhaps? So the um, exchange students um, for, if they're in the College of Business, they go to like Carly Hurd and Chad Pinkelman and those individuals. So they have the those academic advisors. If they're not, they um, we have um, an individual within the um, ACPC, Academic Career Planning Center, that they work with, but not necessarily faculty, but I think that's a good idea to sort of look at of trying to match up interests maybe. And um, as far as students, we do have um, an international partner program, so orientation will students that want to have um, a partner, whether it's another international student that's a degree seeking student or a American student, will partner them up if they want and assign them. And usually we try and find similar interests. So if a student's a business student, we try and find like a junior, senior level business student, pair them up. Chuck? Did you, I noticed you had programs pretty much around the globe, but not in South America. Is that a growth area? Um, I, so I, yes, I, I know the, um, Center for Academic and Global Engagement, they have identified a couple partners in Latin America. Um, there again, it kind of comes to the certain countries might not be, the services they have might not be equipped. We do send a lot of students to Costa Rica um, on provider programs, so students do pay more for those, but we are looking at ways to try and find a partner in Costa Rica or we've heard Peru or a few other um, possibilities, so that is on, on the agenda, so to speak, so. Yes, um, we will have a handful of um, students that are in master's programs at home, um, but they might, for whatever reason, they can come and take undergraduate courses and it works for their home university. But, but they are, yeah, undergraduate students primarily, the vast majority, so. Anyone else? Okay, well, thank you for your time today. Appreciate it.